All right, hello everyone, and welcome to our actual lectures that we're going to be doing now that we are fully online. And we are going to be going over the rest of chapter seven on emotion, which I don't know about you guys, but I have definitely uh, been feeling throughout this week. Um, so uh, yeah, that's pertinent. Um, thank you to everyone who turned in your um, first assignment that we had about your research question and uh, annotated bibliography. I will be grading those throughout this week and providing feedback to you. So when you get your grade, it's not just your grade, you will also be able to go into Blackboard, view um, that assignment, and see comments that I have left for you about maybe the articles that you chose, um, directions that you could take this, recommendations, etc. So just because you maybe got a full score doesn't mean not to check the comments. Anyway, um, I hope you guys are uh, able to be adjusting to all of your online classes. I know that it is uh, definitely pretty difficult, so we're going to try to make this as easy as possible. So let's go ahead and just uh, try to breeze through the rest of this. I'm going to do uh, miniature lectures so that you can just do less than 10 minutes at a time. That's my goal. And uh, cover just kind of a few chunks of PowerPoint slides. And so if you were in class before spring break, um, we left off right after talking about Phineas Gage. Um, so in your lecture slide on, I believe, number 19, slide 19, you will see a slide about damage the prefrontal cortex that blunts emotion. Um, so this is all about Phineas Gage, and he is one of our, you know, Psych 101 type of personalities, shall we say, of showing how one you can really survive some pretty extreme things even without antibiotics, um, but it's rare. Two, just because you survive doesn't mean that your brain doesn't change. And as we saw with Phineas Gage, after the rod went through the skull and through the prefrontal cortex, he had some massive changes, especially to different things that interact with emotion. So, you know, when we look at Phineas Gage, he had trouble after his injury with things like impulsivity. Um, he became more likely to gamble, to do things that, um, you know, healthy brain, um, you know, individuals are usually able to inhibit. Of course, as we probably all know right now, being under a lot of stress from the pandemic, Sometimes we have a lot of load on the prefrontal cortex. It doesn't just have to be due to physical damage, but executive functions are often stressed and can cause the same type of effects. So right now, you yourself may be facing challenges with, you know, inhibiting or paying attention, or you might be more prone to doing impulsive acts. And for you, that may just look like you're playing too much video games or you're eating too much junk food, or maybe you're doing the opposite and you're staring off or not eating. All of these are also signs that, you know, the prefrontal cortex is not operating as it should. And so we're not all Phineas Gage right now, but there are lessons that we can learn from prefrontal cortex damage that we can see in ourselves right now as we're going through a lot of stress. So that's just to kind of, you know, take a look at what we saw last time and how it's going to apply moving forward. So as we move on to the next slides about decision making and prefrontal cortex damage, you're going to see a slide that talks about the Iowa gambling task. If any of you have uh, Miss McMullen for a uh, uh, instructor or Dr. Tony Buchanan, then you probably have heard about this or the Wisconsin card sorting task. 
these tasks are really great for looking at inhibition or lack thereof. Um, so basically, you know, a participant discovers that there are payoffs by trial and error. And they're trying to choose the best strategy while playing this game with these different cards. And there are different cards, like in the example on our slide, C and D, that actually have the best payoff. But you have to be able to think about long-term versus short-term rewards. And when we see that somebody has prefrontal cortex damage, it's much more difficult for them to look at this. And so we find that controls will show signs of nervous tension whenever they draw a card from decks A and B, and they start shifting their preference towards C and D. That's what we want to see in a healthy prefrontal cortex. But when we have different patients with prefrontal cortex damage, they don't show any of this nervous tension with decks A and B. Instead, they just kind of keep drawing any deck and they're like, yeah, whatever, this is all fine. And they don't start to shift their preference over to deck C and D, which have a better payoff in the end, even though it's not immediately gratifying. So what do we see here? Well, after brain damage that impairs emotion, people make impulsive decisions. Um, and evidently because they don't imagine how bad a poor decision might make them feel, they're more likely to keep making the poor decision. And that's what we do under stress as well. So there's kind of a quote about this of failure to anticipate the unpleasantness of a likely outcome leads to bad decisions. If you're not thinking about how bad something you're gonna do in the future is gonna be, then you're gonna keep doing the bad decision. You can think about that right now with people who aren't social distancing, who don't think anything bad is going to happen because maybe they aren't following the news from other countries that are ahead of us. And so they're like, eh, whatever, go into the beach. My little cousin went to the beach for her spring break. I'm so fired up about it. But if you're not thinking about the unpleasantness of the future, then you'll continue to make the bad decision. So another example of this is a person with prefrontal cortex damage is, say, in a situation of a car skidding on ice. And would they do what they'd been taught and fear emotion? Would it impact this? This is something to kind of think about. You know, how would somebody with that type of damage react in that situation? So if you move on to our next slide, where it shows amygdala damage and how it impairs the ability to feel fear, we kind of see how fear has an impact on our decision making. Fear is necessary. We need to have fear to protect ourselves. There are people who don't feel fear, whether it's because of amygdala damage, um, the way they've socially been brought up to face certain situations, and we see that it has negative impacts because we need a certain amount of fear within our environment in order for us to not do super risky things. So there's something called urbach vifid disease, and um, I should probably spell that out for you, um, which I think I'll put in the, the link below on YouTube. And it's a rare genetic disorder where people have skin lesions, um, and there's an accumulation um, in the amygdala of calcium until the amygdala actually wastes away. Um, so you can actually see from the images in the slide of a healthy comparison versus um, patient SM where the amygdala is gone. Um, bilateral, both sides, the amygdala has atrophied. So this person has been found to just be happy to hold a snake at an exotic pet store, which isn't the normal reaction for everyone, though there are some people out there who are totally cool with this. Um, I'm personally 
one of the people who's like, yeah, I'll hold a tarantula, but that's not normal. Um, biologically, we're meant to fear certain animals to keep us safe. Um, you know, the staff actually had to keep patient SM from touching tarantulas and venomous snakes. Um, you know, this is kind of the, the person who's willing to just poke a monster at a haunted house, um, who could be held up at gunpoint and knife point um, and be physically assaulted several times and not learn from it. Um, I do believe that Dr. Buchanan has worked with this patient up in Iowa um, and has told us stories about how sh she just doesn't, doesn't care at all, like happy-go-lucky person, um, has a very crass sense of humor, um, and really has just like been robbed um, and, and isn't able to learn from that because of not having fear. Um, you know, and, and it causes an over-trustworthiness um, and a willingness to approach people that you probably shouldn't, um, you know, not being able to really read angry, scary facial expressions as well. Um, so this fearlessness is definitely dangerous. It is not biologically protective and something that we want to have. All right, I will see you guys in the next mini lecture and we will continue on with other scary things.